Times of the night, but we will rise to the occasion. We will make our people happier and our nation stronger. We will do this by starting the world war, destroying our labor movement, privatizing huge swaths of our economy, and doing the Holocaust. <laughs> Times will happen hard, but we will rise to the occasion. We will make our people happier and nation stronger. We will do this by making trade deals, supporting labor unions, investing in the public sector, and protecting minority rights. Well, gee, I can't tell these guys apart at all. Hey, I know you. Do that jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Liberal Fascism, the Secret History of the American Left from Mussolini to the Politics of Change by Jonah Goldberg, Broadway Books, 2007. Sorry to bias this review right off the bat, but my takeaway from this text is that Goldberg thinks that because fascist politicians want to make their country better and they held rallies and waved banners, and because modern liberals want to make their country better and they hold rallies and wave banners, then these two groups are exactly the same. Even though, like, all political parties want to make the country better and hold rallies and wave banners, every political ideology outside of, like, anarcho-capitalism or passadism would be considered fascist under this criteria. But if I were to be fair and balanced, like a referee on a unicycle, then I'd say the key idea of the text would be this. While folks on the left have long argued that fascism is the marriage of government and big business, and so fascism in America would look like nationalistic jingoism with a <laughs> Big Mac and a large Coke, Goldberg disagrees with this interpretation, and instead argues that fascism is actually the marriage of government and civilian life, through a sort of imposed collectivism, which has long been a part of U.S. history from the progressive era of the 1910s to the hippies of the 60s to Obama's hope and change rhetoric. As Goldberg puts it, I am not saying that all liberals are fascists, nor am I saying that to believe in socialized medicine or smoking bans is evidence that you are a crypto-Nazi. What I am mainly trying to do is to dismantle the granite-like assumption in our political culture that American conservatism is an offshoot or cousin of fascism. Rather, as I will try to show, many of the ideas and impulses that inform what we call liberalism come to us through an intellectual tradition that led directly to fascism. As an aside, I decided to read Goldberg's most recent book, Suicide of the West, to get a better idea of his worldview. And in that book, he says that he firmly believes that classical liberalism is the end of history. That classical liberalism exists on top of a mountain. It is the peak of society. And to go in any direction, to the right towards nationalism or the left towards socialism, would be going down the mountain and therefore would be reactionary. Basically, Goldberg is a classical liberal type who literally calls the Enlightenment era the miracle and sees any deviation from his very specific and bizarre interpretation of the Enlightenment as some kind of reactionary statist fascism. So let's keep that in mind going forward as we take a look at liberal fascism, trying to follow this ideological thread that led from fascism to modern liberalism. Let's see how strong this thread is, or if it even actually exists, taking a look at the text in depth, starting with the introduction where Goldberg gives us his definition of fascism, stating, Fascism is a religion of the state. It assumes the organic unity of the body politic and longs for a national leader attuned to the will of the people. It is totalitarian in that it views everything as political and holds that any action by the state is justified to achieve the common good. It takes responsibility for all aspects of life including our health and well-being, and seeks to impose uniformity of thought and action, whether by force or through regulation and social pressure. Everything, including the economy and religion, must be aligned with its objectives. Any rival identity is part of the problem, and therefore defined as the enemy. Now, there are aspects of this definition I can get behind, such as religious adherence to the nation-state and imposing uniformity of thought and action. But overall, this definition is long-winded and yet vague to the point of uselessness. Goldberg mentions totalitarianism, but describes it as the government being overly involved in our lives, whereas totalitarianism is actually more about centralized rulers acting against the will of the governed. He doesn't provide any description of a fascist worldview, no mention of goals, nothing that tells me what fascism as a political ideology wants to achieve. But I suppose we'll get into that as we move along. 
Before we do that, though, I suppose I should give my own definition of fascism for comparison. I would say that fascism is a political ideology characterized by a nationalistic reactionary worldview, where the fascists' rightful place at the head of society has been taken away from them through corruption and degeneracy. And so, the fascists must defeat the corrupting elements and return themselves to their proper place, returning to a more traditional, idyllic, imagined past with themselves as the leaders of their nation. Anyways, let's get into the text proper. Chapter 1, Mussolini, the Father of Fascism. Alright, to start us off on our journey of understanding the connection between fascism and modern liberalism, Goldberg states, The American Legion, which has been for nearly its entire history a great and generous American institution, was founded the same year as Mussolini's takeover and, in its early years, drew inspiration from the Italian fascist movement. Do not forget, the Legion's national commander declared that same year, that the fascisti are to Italy what the American Legion is to the United States. Aha! The jingoistic, reactionary, anti-communist veterans club the American Legion was politically aligned with fascism? That doesn't surprise me at all. But this ties fascism to reactionary, anti-communist conservatism, not liberalism. Anyway, Goldberg continues. One thing is clear, the French Revolution was the first totalitarian revolution, the mother of modern totalitarianism and the spiritual model for the Italian fascist, German Nazi, and Russian communist revolutions. A nationalist populist uprising, it was led and manipulated by an intellectual vanguard determined to replace Christianity with a political religion that glorified the people, anointed the revolutionary vanguards their priests, and abridged the rights of individuals. Oh, the French Revolution! Overthrowing monarchy and replacing it with democracy, that's some totalitarianism if I've ever seen it. But like we saw in his definition of fascism, Goldberg doesn't see totalitarianism as an issue between dictatorship and democracy, he sees it as the government being involved in our lives, in which case the government of the French Revolution was more involved with the lives of the citizens than under monarchy, I guess, and so it was more totalitarian, apparently, according to Goldberg. But let's get to the fascism. Let's get to Mr. Moosey, the Moosinator, Moosey McMoosterson himself. Goldberg explains that while fighting in World War I, Mussolini turned away from caring about economic class and towards nationalism when he saw soldiers sacrificing their life not for class struggle, but for their nation. As Goldberg puts it, He began to formulate the idea of Trincerocrasia, that veterans deserved to run the country because they had sacrificed more and had the discipline to improve Italy's plight. And you and I both know that this is a common sentiment among liberals. Ask any liberal and they'll tell you that socioeconomic status isn't actually that important. What we really need is jingoistic military rule. We see this spouted by the liberal media all the time. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part too. They're doing their part. Are you? Join the mobile infantry and save the world. Service guarantees citizenship. Oh, I guess what makes Mussolini left wing is that in 1919, him and a few others founded the Fasci di Combattimento, a military focused political party that pushed for things like ending the draft instituting a minimum wage, establishing age limits for hazardous working conditions, a progressive tax on capital, nationalizing industries related to the military. Okay, potentially tenuously liberal things here. Let's continue. In November, the newly named and explicitly left-wing fascists ran a slate of candidates in the national elections. They got trounced at the hands of the socialists. Most historians claim that this is what taught Mussolini to move to the right. This, I think, distorts the picture. Mussolini did not move fascism from left to right, he moved it from socialist to populist. Huh. I mean, it's my understanding that fascism in Italy and Germany was largely a reactionary response to the Soviet revolution abroad and radical unionism at home, what with wealthy and upper middle class folks fearing a Soviet-style revolution within their own countries. But to be fair, I'm not super familiar with the Fasci di Compartimento or its history, so let's take a brief look at Wikipedia to compare. According to Wikipedia, there was a great deal of confusion regarding what the new organization officially stood for. In general, its stances were radically different from those of later fascism, as the early fasci proclaimed its opposition to censorship, militarism, and dictatorship. Okay, it seems like the fascist political party initially had some liberal goals. Let's continue. After the disastrous results in the November 1919 election, the membership of the fasci dwindled with fewer than 4,000 members left by the end of the year. 
Mussolini briefly considered leaving politics, emigrating away from Italy, and pursuing a career in writing fiction. However, it soon became apparent that the newly elected parliament was unable to form any governing coalition. The largest party were the Socialists, a situation that alarmed the conservatives and made them seek new political allies to block any potential socialist government. Mussolini saw an opportunity to reorient the fasci towards an alliance with the traditional political right and decided to remain in politics. Huh, so it seems like Goldberg was basically on the right track? The fasci were originally simply a pro-veteran party that held many left-leaning views, but when that didn't get them anywhere, Mussolini saw an opportunity to move the fascist party to the right and pick up a lot of support from desperate conservatives who feared socialism. Goldberg continues, In the summer of 1922, when the communists and socialists called for a general strike to protest the government's refusal to clamp down on the fascists, Mussolini declared that if the government didn't break the strike, his fascists would do it themselves. He didn't wait for or expect a response. When the Reds launched their strike on July 31st, Mussolini's squadristi, made up largely of skilled ex-military troops, broke it within a day. They drove the streetcars, kept the traffic moving, and, most famously, got the trains running on time. So, did Goldberg make a little whoopsie-daisy when titling this book Liberal Fascism? He admits that the right-wing American Legion was aligned with fascism, that Mussolini was a militant nationalist, and that the fascists in Italy were right-wing anti-socialists. I'm not seeing any liberal fascism here, uh, but let's keep going. Chapter 2, Adolf Hitler, Man of the Left. Hitler a man of the left, huh? That's interesting because if you've seen the recent Lonerbox video on Weimar Germany, you saw that a whopping one-third of those who voted for the Nazi party in the election of 1930 were right-wing nationalists, while only one-tenth were left-leaning social democrats the remaining voters being centrists or first-time voters. So it doesn't really sound like support from the Nazis was coming from the left. It seems like it was overwhelmingly coming from the right. So let's see how Goldberg spins, or I mean explains, how Hitler was a man of the left. To start, Goldberg explains that although Hitler wasn't very ideologically coherent, there were four significant ideas which guided his political project. Power concentrated in himself, his hatred and fear of Jews, faith in the racial superiority of the German Volk, and ultimately, war to demonstrate and secure the other three. Yeah, that all seems accurate, nothing to note here. Goldberg then looks at the common story about the Nazi rise to power, that Hitler targeted resentment at Germany's failure in World War I, blaming it all on Jews and communists, and so right-wing Germans, as well as capitalists and industrialists, sided with the Nazis and their war against the left. Or, as it's explained in Lonerbox's recent video, In 1929, the Great Depression threw millions of people out of work, and the people they were most likely to flock to was the Communist Party. The growth of the Communist Party, with their violent rhetoric and promises to usher in a Soviet Germany, caused the middle classes to, um, shite themselves. They knew full well what happened to people like them in Russia after 1918, and they quickly abandoned the failing conventional right-wing parties to rally around the Nazis instead. This is the understanding of the Nazi rise to power which I agree with. But Goldberg thinks it's all just a myth, a distortion of the real history. He argues that the fight between Nazis and communists wasn't a fight of right versus left, but rather a fight between two leftist parties. Demonstrating this leftism of the Nazis, Goldberg states, Nazism also emphasized many of the themes of later new lefts and other places and times. The primacy of race, the rejection of nationalism, an emphasis on the organic and holistic, including environmentalism, health food, and exercise, and most of all, the need to transcend notions of class. I mean, can't you see the connection? The Nazis believed that the concept of race was significant because they saw their race as superior to others. And your hippie great uncle also believes the concept of race is significant, as demonstrated by his BLM bumper sticker. The Nazis rejected reason in favor of the occult and race science. And your liberal arts graduate great uncle rejects reason in favor of a postmodernist critique of reason. The Nazis valued healthy food and exercise because those things would prove that the Aryans were the master race and your yoga-doing vegan great-uncle also values healthy food and exercise. The Nazis wanted to transcend the current notions of class by creating a reactionary ethnostate. And your hippy-dippy great-uncle also wants to transcend the current notions of class by bringing about more social justice and equity. 
Don't you see? They're basically the same thing. Getting even sillier, Goldberg argues that Hitler deserved to be placed firmly on the left because first and foremost, he was a revolutionary. Broadly speaking, the left is the party of change, the right, the party of the status quo. Interesting. Goldberg thinks that revolutions are necessarily left-wing since they want to challenge the status quo. Does that mean the Reagan revolution was left-wing? What about the military juntas which took over in Chile and Brazil and Indonesia and elsewhere? Were those left-wing? Of course not. But I actually do agree with the second half of his statement. The left is the party of change, if by change we mean progress, progressing beyond the status quo, beyond the failures of the past and the present. And the right is the party of the status quo, or even a return to a perceived status quo. For example, when Donald Trump said, We will make America proud again, we will make America safe again, and yes, together, we will make America great again. I know I could have just pulled up the video and played the quote, but I, I kind of wanted to do the impression. Um, what do you think? How'd I do, huh? Anyway, uh, or similarly, when Adolf Hitler said, The national government will therefore regard it as its first and supreme task to restore to the German people unity of mind and will. Both men were calling for a return to a more idyllic status quo, galvanizing their right-wing supporters. Also, remember this Hitler quote, by the way, and we'll come back to it later. Discussing the Nazi Party platform, Goldberg states, In 1920, the Nazi Party issued its unalterable and eternal party platform. Co-written by Hitler and Anto Drexler, the most striking thing about the platform was its concerted appeal to socialistic and populist economics, including providing a livelihood for citizens, abolition of income from interest, the nationalization of war profits, the nationalization of trusts, shared profits with labor, expanded old age pensions, etc., etc., etc. There are three important things to keep in mind here. One, all sides of a political spectrum will appeal to all aspects of their society, though they'll do so in very different ways. For example, when Donald Trump said that he's going to bring back the good-paying coal factory union jobs, did that make him a leftist? No, of course not. And when Joe Biden says, God bless our troops, does that make him right-wing? No, of course not. Similarly, two, pointing to a few left-leaning policies of a right-wing politician doesn't make them left-wing. Pointing to a few right-leaning policies of a left-wing politician doesn't make them right-wing. Some appeals to socialists doesn't make a platform socialist. But most importantly, three, given how powerful communism and industrial unionism was at the time, the fear of radical unionism, the recent Soviet revolution, any party needed to make appeals to those sectors of society, even if those appeals were to placate them. And when you look at books like Black Shirts and Reds or Fascism and Big Business, you'll see that despite its appeals to communism or unionism, fascism was truly just a right-wing reactionary response to leftist radicalism. Anyways, lastly, Goldberg argues, What distinguished Nazism was that it forthrightly included a worldview we now associate almost completely with the political left. Identity politics. I'm going to do this one sarcastically because <laughs> this sounds like something Sargon would say. Yeah, totally. And I bet Goldberg just loved this little beauty. Your, Your racial, racial identity, identity is the most important thing. thing. Everything, Everything should be looked at through the lens of race. Jinx, you owe me a Coke. Damn. Now, I know that you already know that this is stupid, but in case you don't, like in case you happen to be Jonah Goldberg himself watching this video, let me explain. Just because various political ideologies might agree that a concept exists, that doesn't mean that they will agree on what to do in regards to that concept. For example, a neo-Nazi might use identity politics to say that there is too much racial conflict in the U.S., and so to solve that, we must close the southern border and deport non-white citizens. And using identity politics, a liberal would agree with the neo-Nazi that there is too much racial conflict in the U.S., but the liberal solution would be completely different. Better representation of people of color in media, preferential loans and tax incentives to help diversify neighborhoods or universities and workplaces, other changes that would bridge divides between racial groups. Mr. Goldberg, does that make sense? Two political ideologies can agree on the existence of a thing and still be opposing ideologies? You get that? Okay, moving on. Chapter 3, Woodrow Wilson and the Birth of Liberal Fascism. This chapter basically argues that because socialism and fascism are the same thing, and if progressivism is kind of like socialism, 
then progressivism is fascism too, even if these terms have nothing in common. For example, Goldberg states, Call it what you like. Progressivism, fascism, communism, or totalitarianism. The first true enterprise of this kind was established not in Russia or Italy or Germany, but in the United States, and Woodrow Wilson was the 20th century's first fascist dictator. <laughs> Now, that sounds pretty silly, but he has some arguments to support his claim, so let's hear him out. His first argument is that Wilson jailed more dissenters than Mussolini did which isn't that surprising since the U.S. population in the 1910s was just under 100 million, while the Italian population in the 1920s was around 36 million. His next argument is that Wilson did more violence toward civil liberties than Mussolini did, what with propaganda and censorship and repression, to which I'd say that isn't too surprising either, as we saw in the rise and repression of radical labor, or anything that you happen to read on the radical labor movement or the lives of socialists and anarchists in the U.S. in the 1910s, This was a time of mass repression, deportation, the Sedition Act, the Espionage Act, and all that. I wouldn't call Wilson's administration fascistic, though I would certainly say that the Sedition Act, the Espionage Act, political prisoners, deportations, the crackdown on radical labor, those were themselves fascistic policies. It's very interesting to have a book ostensibly about liberalism in the U.S. and to start with Woodrow Wilson, and not maybe Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, post-Civil War U.S. was politically so mixed up it would be unrecognizable to us today, and it's far too complicated to tell the whole story here, and simply saying Southern strategy or party switch doesn't quite do it justice, but there were some changes between Democrats being the party of the KKK and passing Jim Crow laws at the beginning of the 1900s, and fighting the KKK and passing the Civil Rights Act just 50 years later. To give a very, very brief look at the history leading up to Wilson's presidency, let's start with based Republican President Abraham Lincoln, who said things like, Labor is prior to and independent of capital. In fact, capital is the fruit of labor. And, These capitalists generally act harmoniously and in concert to fleece the people. Spouting the kinds of things that wouldn't be surprising to hear from AOC or Bernie Sanders today. Meanwhile, of course, the Democratic politicians of the rural South during that time were fighting to maintain a militant slaveocracy. And in the years just after the Civil War, you have Republican President Theodore Roosevelt with his trust-busting and breaking up monopolies and his square deal rhetoric. And after losing the Republican nomination in 1912, Roosevelt created the Progressive Party, since the Republican Party was not progressive enough for him. Meanwhile, you have progressive Republicans at the state level passing the first workplace injury compensation laws, the first income tax laws, and unemployment programs in U.S. history. But, since the Republican Party was split with Roosevelt running third party, the Democrats won at the federal level with Woodrow Wilson winning the presidency. But the Democrats were also split along many lines, with Democrats turning away from the pro-business bourbon Democrats of the Civil War era and towards more populist ideas, developing a base of poor farmers and working class folks generally supporting progressive era reforms such as antitrust laws, the income tax, restrictions on child labor, and things like that. At the same time, the Democratic Party was still full of rural religious conservatives, pushing culture war issues like the American Plan, which targeted women suspected of being sex workers or having STIs, anti-cross-dressing laws, enforcing modesty, prohibition against alcohol, and other fights against degeneracy and moral decay in society conservative culture war issues that would feel right at home in the Republican Party of today. I mean, the Democrat-aligned KKK groups of the 1920s fighting against what they saw as moral decay basically mirror the Republican-aligned neo-Nazi groups of the 2020s fighting against what they see as moral decay in our modern age. Long story short, things were pretty hectic in the time between Republican President Roosevelt and Democrat President Roosevelt. Anyways, back to the text. Continuing to draw this thread between the progressive era of the 1910s and what would become fascism in Italy and Germany, like he's making some kind of wacky conspiracy pinboard, Goldberg states, No nation influenced American thinking more profoundly than Germany. W.E.B. Dubois, Charles Beard, Walter Weyl, Richard Eli, Nicholas Mary Butler, and countless other founders of modern American liberalism were among the 9,000 Americans who studied in German universities during the 19th century. Apparently, the thousands of American liberals who went to universities in Germany in the 1910s were indoctrinated in fascism. I mean, come on, we all know the colleges of Weimar Germany were bastions of fascist thought. I'm kidding, of course. 
I guess Goldberg doesn't know that interwar Germany was plagued with political infighting. Disagreements between social democrats, socialists, communists, anarchists, nationalists, and fascists over how World War I should have been handled, about the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, the Soviet Revolution, how best to improve the government and the economy. If you're unfamiliar with this history, it's basically like Goldberg said that there was unanimous political opinion in the U.S., just after the Civil War. His argument about liberal intellectuals studying in Germany in the 1910s is literally that stupid. Pointing to the support for World War I, Goldberg states, America entered the war in 1917. Progressive intellectuals, versed in the same doctrines and philosophies popular on the European continent, leaped at the opportunity to remake society through the discipline of the sword. Sure, maybe some liberals supported the war, but are we just going to pretend that the radicals who were jailed or deported under the Espionage Act or Sedition Act, like, that didn't happen? Well, I guess Goldberg doesn't want to ignore this, because he brings up the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act and those who were jailed for criticizing the government. But, uh, Goldberg, I wonder who was most impacted by those laws, conservatives on the right or socialists, communists, and anarchists on the left? But wait, Goldberg is totally aware of this history, stating... Socialists and other leftists who agitated against the war were brutalized. And he mentions things like IWW members being rounded up and put on train cars and left in the desert, the lynching of Wesley Everest by the American Legion, and things like that. But wait, now I'm confused. Is the left fascistic for supporting the war, or the victims of fascism for fighting against the war? How is it that left-leaning Americans are framed as both jingoistic war hawks and anti-war deserters facing mass repression? Well, this is because Goldberg playfully goes back and forth between focusing on the extremism and militarism of the left and calling that fascism when convenient for his arguments, and then looking at mainstream liberals in the federal government fighting against those radicals and calling that fascism when it suits him. Anyways, lastly, he states, Perhaps the greatest irony is that, according to most of the criteria we use to locate people and policies on the ideological spectrum in the American context, social bases, demographics, economic policies, social welfare provisions, Adolf Hitler was indisputably to Wilson's left. Huh. Interesting. Well, Wilson most certainly wasn't on the left compared to progressives, both in the Democrat and Republican Party of his day, not to mention all the radical socialists and anarchists that he was mass arresting and deporting, but Hitler to the left of Wilson, huh? Uh, then why did the Nazis get so much support from right-wing voters then? Chapter 4, Franklin Roosevelt's Fascist New Deal To start, Goldberg states, Franklin Roosevelt was no fascist, at least not in the sense that he thought of himself in this way, but many of his ideas and policies were indistinguishable from fascism, and today we live with the fruits of fascism, and we call them liberal. Then, showing that he has no idea what any of those terms mean, he goes on to argue, while fascism and Bolshevism were surely heresies of Marxism, Leninism was a kind of applied Marxism. So too was fascism, as well as technocracy, Fabianism, socialism, corporatism, war socialism, German social democracy, and so on. You heard it here first, folks. Bolshevism is fascism. Marxism is fascism. Leninism is fascism. Socialism is fascism. Corporatism is fascism. Even social democracy is fascism. Every time the government does stuff, it's fascism. The bigger the government, the more fascist it is. This logic isn't too surprising coming from Goldberg. As I explained in the intro, he sees classical liberalism as the end of history, atop a mountain, and any direction from that peak is reactionary, or in this case, fascistic, according to Goldberg. Anyways, next he talks about the National Recovery Act, the NRA, an aspect of the New Deal which black folks termed Negro Runaround, Negro Removal Act, or Negroes Robbed Again. And, like, yeah, it was the 1930s. Jim Crow was alive and well in the U.S. But wishing that the New Deal wasn't racist isn't a conservative position. A conservative would hate the New Deal whether it was racist or not. Wishing for the New Deal to be better is a progressive position. Goldberg's argument is irrelevant. Either way, basically after FDR, liberal became synonymous for support for the New Deal, while conservative meant you were opposed to it. And as policy leanings between the two parties continued to shift, liberalism became more associated with the Democratic Party and conservatism with the Republican Party. Anti-New Deal Democrats fled to third parties or joined the Republican Party. 
Chapter 5, the 1960s, Fascism Takes to the Streets. Hey man, like, you know what's groovy? You know what's like, far out? Maintaining the purity of your race against like, degeneracy, man. Can you dig? Like, give military dictatorship a chance, you know? Or as Goldberg puts it, in popular myth, the 1960s was a gentle utopian movement that opposed the colonialist Vietnam War abroad and sought greater social equality and harmony at home. In its strictly political dimension, there is no denying that the movement's activist core was little more than a fascist youth cult. Historically, fascism is of necessity and by design a form of youth movement, and all youth movements have more than a whiff of fascism about them. Is this the original Antifa or the real fascists? Like, hey, those hippies that are calling Nixon a fascist, they're the real fascists. Next, Goldberg talks about the fringes of the 1960s youth culture. Militant groups like the Black Panthers, who, according to Goldberg, went around assassinating the police and plotting terror attacks, all while being glorified and revered by the new left more broadly. Basically, Goldberg sees the Black Panthers with their community outreach and their food banks and their free breakfast programs. I, I mean, I mean, he sees the Black Panthers with their army uniforms and their marching and their violence and threats of violence. And he sees the Nazi brown shirts with their uniforms and their marching and their violence. And he concludes that these two groups are the exact same. Except, let's think about the goals of these two groups. The Nazis wanted a militaristic, segregationist, reactionary ethnostate. And the Black Panthers wanted, well, what the heck did the Black Panthers want again? What is the policy of the Black Panther Party? Because a lot of people don't know. Policy, maybe you might be talking well, maybe about that's the wrong philosophy. Word, you know? Philosophy, well, is, philosophy word, is basically yeah. what we call intercommunalism. We're yeah. not nationalists. Right. We don't believe in uh, nationalism. Nationalism, or nationhood, you know, always hooked yeah. up, is yeah. akin to superiority, is akin to racism. Is a kind of That's what I said in my song. Say, so we're not that. So we understand the world to be a form of dispersed communities. Yeah. You know? And the technology and travel and communications nowadays mm. interconnects the communities of the world, peoples of the world, it is everywhere. Really this is very important. You see. Yeah. So understanding this, then we have an understanding of the economics of intercommunalism, which is based on redistribution of the wealth. And that's where you see the programs, the survival programs, becoming uh, uh, significant and redistributing the basic wealth to the poor and oppressed people of the world. You know, three quarters of the world is poor and oppressed. Yeah. But we practice it in the black community so the rest of the world can learn. Yeah. So people stop getting united behind skin color and all that other stuff. They yeah. get, the poor oppressed people get, get united poor around poor, basic right? programs that serves their basic interests. Oh, yeah. Basically, the complete opposite of the Nazis. Anyway, lumping various left-leaning schools of thought together, Goldberg argues that... Deconstructionism, existentialism, postmodernism, pragmatism, relativism, all of these ideas had the same purpose, to erode the iron chains of tradition, dissolve the concrete foundations of truth, and firebomb the bunkers, where the defenders of the ancien regime still fought and persevered. Okay, first off, concrete foundations of truth? I'd love to see Goldberg attempt an intelligent conversation on that subject. Although the conversation would probably not get beyond because divine command theory, that's why. Okay. Anyways, all these liberals and progressives, they want to erode tradition, and that's fascism because that's what Hitler wanted. Hitler's agenda was to rip apart everything the bourgeoisie had created, to destroy the reactionaries, to create new art and architecture, new culture, new religion, and most of all, new Germans. But um, Goldberg's version of Hitler kind of sounds like the opposite of the real guy. Hitler was a reactionary who celebrated German romantic realist art and hated modern art, celebrated classic music and hated jazz and swing music, celebrated an ideal view of the past and hated the modern intellectual and cultural movements, such as the cabarets in Berlin. Though, maybe Hitler was just huffing a big bag of copium. Maybe he was big mad molding because the cool kids never invited him to the jazz concerts or art shows or cabarets. In fact, do you remember that Hitler quote I read from chapter 2 about restoring the German people? Let's read a little bit more of that quote. Hitler stated, The national government will therefore regard it as its first and supreme task to restore to the German people unity of mind and will. It will preserve and defend the foundations on which the strength of our nation rests. It will take under its firm protection Christianity as the basis of our morality and the family as the nucleus of our nation and our state. Huh. Doesn't sound like Hitler wants to destroy the reactionaries and create new art, new architecture, new culture, and new religion, and most of all, new Germans. It kind of sounds like he is a conservative reactionary who wants the complete opposite of those things. Moving on. You want to know a big connection between fascism and modern liberalism? 
thus proving Goldberg's conspiracy corkboard isn't just a bunch of bonkers nonsense? How about their use of the word streets? As Goldberg puts it, the radicals talked incessantly about taking it to the streets of the need for street theater, street protest, street activism. Fascists were always fixated with the street. Clear the streets for the brown battalions. Soon we'll fly Hitler flags over every street. You see, the hippies took to the streets and the fascists took to the streets. Any political action that involves using streets is fascism. The March on Washington? Fascism. JFK's motorcade? Fascism. When Trump told his supporters to march down the street towards the Capitol to overthrow our democracy? Okay, well, maybe, maybe that one was kind of fascism. If you think that that logic is faulty, and I don't see how you could, it's foolproof. But in case you do, it's not just the word street which is suspect, but whole quotes. For example, Goldberg argues, Substitute the word fascist for radical in many of Saul Linsky's statements, and it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference. The radical may resort to the sword, but when he does, he is not filled with hatred against those individuals whom he attacks. He hates these individuals not as persons, but as symbols representing ideas or interests, which he believes to be inimical to the welfare of the people. Or I suppose it could equally read, the fascist may resort to the sword, but when he does, he is not filled with hatred against those individuals whom he attacks. He hates these individuals not as persons, but as symbols representing ideas or interests, which he believes to be inimical to the welfare of the people. And don't you try and tell me that simply changing one word in a statement could completely alter its meaning. That's impossible. Someone saying 100 anti-war demonstrators took to the streets could just as easily have said 100 KKK demonstrators took to the streets. Those statements would obviously mean the same thing. Finishing the chapter strong, Goldberg goes back to conflating fascist militancy with the militancy of the Black Panther Party, stating, by the end of the decade, the civil rights movement had, for all intents and purposes, became a black power movement. And black power, with its clenched fists, Afro-pagan mythology, celebration of violence, emphasis on racial pride, and disdain for liberalism was arguably America's most authentic indigenous fascism. Getting into detail on this is beyond the scope of this video, but if you know, then you know that black power groups and black separatist groups, they might both want to challenge the systemic racism against black folks in the U.S., but the former wants more racial equality and justice and multiculturalism, while the latter agrees with the Nazis and wants to create ethnostates. You can't really conflate these two. Speaking of black separatism, though, in a way, this book kind of like predicted the jumbled mess that is the current online political landscape. It's like some sort of JREG political compass video, the way online politics tries to prove horseshoe theory correct, with eco-fascists and MAGA communists and Nazbols and Black Hammer and like, psh, maybe liberalism is a pipeline of fascism after all. In response to all this, Goldberg gawks and wonders why mainstream liberals don't disavow these fascists in their midst. But let's be realistic about this. Fringe groups that are allowed online don't exactly represent the electorate. If you were to ask a mainstream liberal, what's your stance on the Black Hammer group? What do you think about MAGA communists? They would say, um, who? Chapter 6, From Kennedy's Myth to Johnson's Dream, Liberal Fascism and the Cult of the State. Describing John F. Kennedy's fascism, Goldberg states, What made JFK's administration so popular? What made it so effective? What has given it its lasting appeal? On almost every front, the answers are those very elements that fit the fascist playbook. The creation of crises, nationalistic appeals to unity, the celebration of martial values, the blurring of lines between public and private sectors, the utilization of mass media to glamorize the state and its programs, invocations of a new post-partisan spirit that places the important decisions in the hands of experts and intellectual supermen, and the cult of personality for the national leader. Huh. The creation of a crisis is fascism? Goldberg should not read the shock doctrine then, because he'd learn that all his Austrian school Milton Friedman buddies are fascists. Regarding that other stuff, appeals to national unity, martial values, using media to glamorize government programs, that's all pretty standard fare for any president. I mean, they're literally the commander-in-chief of the armed forces and the head of state. Anyways, looking at liberalism more broadly, Goldberg attempts to give a brief history of liberalism's love of the state, starting with, of course, the Frankfurt School, or the Franklin School, as Mark Levin calls it. Goldberg states, 
a handful of immensely influential Marxist theorists, mostly German from the so-called Frankfurt School, transported to Columbia University beginning in the 1930s, married psychology and Marxism to provide a new vocabulary for liberalism. This is essentially the Jordan Peterson argument about postmodern neo-Marxists. That because fascism and communism are the same thing, that means the disasters that were Nazi Germany and the USSR discredited Marxism. And so, in order to get the public to continue to fall for Marxism, the Frankfurt School intellectuals moved away from discussing class struggle and started talking about their feelings and race and gender and all that SJW stuff. It's clear to me that Goldberg doesn't care to, or maybe know, how to differentiate between the state and the government. On top of this, I'm betting he wishes he had coined the phrase postmodern neo-fascist. Anyways, Goldberg complains that liberals keep falling for the arguments of the radical left regarding feminism and systemic racism, and they just keep giving out welfare and reparations to all these radical causes. And in response, Goldberg concludes, The Watts riots in 1965 were the real turning point. Not only was the collective liberal intelligentsia determined to blame white America, the system, for the violence, but the violence itself became morally admirable rebellion. These e-liberal liberals supporting a liberal protests? What's the world coming to? I wonder what Goldberg thought of BLM. Just kidding, we know exactly what he thinks of BLM. He hates the Bureau of Land Management. Maintaining federal lands, that's just collectivist fascism. Or, I mean, not that BLM, I mean the Black Lives Matter movement, which he, of course, also hates. It's just the latest round of conservatives lashing out against any fight for liberty and justice. They're doing it against LGBT plus liberation and BLM today. They did it against the various radical movements of the 60s, the civil rights movement, labor struggles, radical labor. Heck, the conservatives would probably stand against Nat Turner and John Brown or even the frickin' Tea Party if they were around to witness them. Chapter 7, Liberal Racism, Eugenic Ghost in the Fascist Machine. To start this chapter on eugenics, Goldberg argues that There's a general consensus among liberal historians that progressivism defies easy definition. Perhaps that's because to identify progressivism properly would be too inconvenient to liberalism, for doing so would expose the eugenic project at its core. Eugenics is at the core of liberalism. You see, eugenics is all about making society better through the state deciding who should be allowed to reproduce. And liberalism wants to allow safe and legal abortions and birth control, thus making society better by allowing people to decide for themselves if they want to reproduce. That's basically the same thing, right? And Goldberg, of course, compares eugenics to abortion, saying that Christians and conservatives stand against things like cloning and abortion, which are eugenics and liberal and fascist. More or less defining liberalism, Goldberg states, What is today called liberalism stands domestically on three legs, support for the welfare state, abortion, and identity politics. Of which Goldberg then explains how each one of these is bad and fascist, but I repeat myself. Of welfare, he states, The progressive authors of welfare state socialism were interested not in protecting the weak from the ravages of capitalism, as modern liberals would have it, but in weeding out the weak and the unfit, and thereby preserving and strengthening the Anglo-Saxon character of the American racial community. And he proves this by quoting Justice Holmes, some guy who was a Republican progressive Supreme Court justice in the early 1900s, who made some sort of social Darwin Malthusian type argument for welfare, despite the fact that no modern liberal or progressive would support that kind of social Darwin race science today, 120 years later. Regarding abortion, he of course talks about Margaret Sanger. The history of Margaret Sanger that he gives starts with her hanging out with Emma Goldman and ends with her giving speeches at KKK rallies. So it seems like Margaret Sanger was a progressive the way that Just Kidding Rowling is a feminist. Perhaps starting out on the right side of history, but slipping down some weird pipeline and ending up a reactionary bigot. Anyways, lastly, of identity politics, Goldberg argues, If liberals assume blacks or women or gays are inherently good, conservatives must think these same groups are inherently bad. This is so stupid. Conservatives love this white guilt, self-hating, good versus evil view of liberal arguments. Jordan Peterson made this same argument as well when talking about the leftist view of the working class in his debate with Slavoj Žižek.
you have a binary class division, proletariat and bourgeoisie, and you have an implicit idea that all of the good is on the side of the proletariat, and all of the evil is on the side of the bourgeoisie. And that's classic group identity thinking, you know, it's one of the reasons I don't like identity politics, is because once you divide people into groups and pit them against one another, it's very easy to assume that all the evil in the world can be attributed to one group, the hypothetical oppressors, and all the good to the other. I have never heard a leftist or progressive claim that workers and black folk are inherently good, and that white folks and wealthy folks are inherently evil. You're fucking a white male! Okay, okay, okay. Technically, out of a country of 300 million people, you can find folks arguing just about anything. But this focus on white guilt and grievance politics is not relevant to the broader left. When the left talks about oppression and injustice, it isn't about the inherent goodness or evil of individuals, it's about brick and mortar stuff. Statistical probabilities, pointing to evidence that an oppression or injustice exists in society. Number of police stops and searches by race, or economic mobility's relation to the education of your parents, or something like that. And then they want to look at how best to remedy that oppression or injustice. Restructuring our criminal justice system, or how school funding works, or fighting for higher education, or something like that. This isn't about the goodness or evil of individuals, it's about equity, social justice, and material conditions. Chapter 8, Liberal Fascist Economics. Being totally incorrect right off the bat, Goldberg argues, The notion that fascism was a tool of big business is one of the most persistent and enduring myths of the past century. Hitler adamantly took the side of the trade union movement over dishonorable employers. Yeah, we know that this isn't true from books like Fascism and Big Business. The truth is that on the eve of fascism's victory, both in Italy and Germany, the labor movement was profoundly weakened and demoralized, not only because of unemployment, not only because of repeated defeats that came from want of bold tactics in the daily clashes with fascist bands, but chiefly because the union organizations had been unable to defend the gains won by the working class. Anyways, getting to the meat of Goldberg's argument, he states, it's fine to say that incestuous relationships between corporations and governments are fascistic. The problem comes when you class that such arrangements are inherently right-wing. If the collusion of big business and government is right-wing, then FDR was a right-winger. If corporatism and propagandistic militarism are fascist, then Woodrow Wilson was a fascist, and so were the New Dealers. If you understand the right-wing, or conservative position, to be that of those who argue for free markets, competition, property rights, and the other political values inscribed in the original intent of the American Founding Fathers, then big business in fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, and New Deal America was not right-wing. It was left-wing, and it was fascistic. Only some Hayek superfan would be so simplistic in their thinking. Is collusion between big business and government right-wing or fascist? It depends on what that collusion accomplishes. It matters whose interests are being represented. A government grant so a company can provide its services cheaper to the citizens, a public housing program, or other social services, those could be left-wing examples of collusion between government and big business. On the other paw, tax loopholes, no-bid contracts for the military, those might be right-wing examples of collusion between government and big business. Getting sillier, Goldberg states, Most businesses are like beehives. If government doesn't bother them, they don't bother government. If government meddles with business, the bees swarm Washington. Yet time and again, the liberal remedy for the bee problem is to smack the hive with a big stick. <laughs> What a baby brain take on the relationship between capitalism and the government. If you know anything about the history of government and business, you know that the growth of government coincides with the growth of capital. From the very first armies and navies instituting and protecting trade routes to modern day trade deals and neo-imperialism. This beehive view of the relationship between capital and government has no basis in reality. <laughs> and the next line is very relevant for the anti-woke crowd. Goldberg states, how do you explain that there is virtually no major issue in the culture wars, from abortion to gay marriage to affirmative action, where big business has played a major role on the American right, while there are dozens of examples of corporations supporting the liberal side? Um, because that's where the money is. 
Why put Dylan Mulvaney on a Budweiser can or whatever the current conservative rage bait thing is? Because the company sees that certain demographics don't typically buy their product, and so they advertise to them, trying to expand their market share. And they also get plenty of free advertising from every knucklehead who bought a case of Bud Light just to shoot it with a crossbow or some shit in their backyard and post it on social media. It doesn't always work out in the company's favor, of course, but these businesses do not have an ideological drive towards liberal values. They have an ideological drive towards making money. Moving along. Goldberg compares diversity hires, forcing employers to hire people of color when they don't want to, to employers being forced to fire Jews in Nazi Germany, and he concludes, Consider this. The restaurant chain Hooters came within a hairbreadth of being forced to hire men as Hooter girls. It seems funny, but just because something is done in the name of diversity doesn't make it unfascist. It just makes it a nicer form of fascism. You heard him. All you folks who are sharing memes about being thirsty for femboy hooters, you all are the real fascists. Actually, isn't there a stereotype about femboys being far right? Maybe Goldberg is actually correct here. <laughs> Maybe femboy hooters would be fascistic after all. Chapter 9, Brave New Village, Hillary Clinton and the Meaning of Liberal Fascism. Goldberg opens, crying out, This is one of the main reasons I've written this book to puncture the smug self-confidence that simply by virtue of being a liberal, one is also virtuous. Um, dude, that's how everyone feels. Everyone believes that their political beliefs are virtuous. Goldberg, do you not feel like your political beliefs have virtue? Looking at the left celebrating militant activists and left-leaning political leaders, he states, This love of hard men, Castro, Che, Arafat, is clearly tied to the leftist obsession with the fascist values of authenticity and will. Whoa, bro, I know plenty of leftists love hard men, but do you really want to cede the values of authenticity and will to fascism? Like, what the fuck? Anyways, getting to Goldberg's main argument of the chapter, he states, if there is ever a fascist takeover in America, it will not come in the form of stormtroopers kicking down doors, but with lawyers and social workers saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Sweet reference to Reagan's nine most terrifying words in the English language bit. Obviously, only some sort of redacted would refer to any lawyer or social worker working for the government as fascism without thinking about what problem they're there to solve or even how they intend to solve that problem. But that's Goldberg's argument, isn't it? That anytime the government tries to provide a social service or any community building, that's the government being fascistic. Making a Candace Owens, Thomas Sewell type argument, Goldberg argues that this liberal project of mixing government with community through social services and programs for poor folks, all of that has actually destroyed the black community. He states, the government used child poverty to crush individualism and pride among inner-city blacks. At the end of the day, the liberal welfare state, based though it may be on love, concern, and niceness, resulted in more damage to the black family, and specifically to black children, than much that can be laid at the feet of racist neglect. Welfare destroys individualism, and community, and families, and children. It steals candy, it kicks puppies. This welfare stuff sounds pretty awful. But wait, didn't Unlearning Economics just do a video on how the data proves that so-called free stuff from the government is actually a win-win and it helps everyone? Funding education increases earnings but can also reduce crime and improve health problems. Funding health enables people to pursue education and employment, reducing the cost of worse health problems down the line. Alleviating poverty, or even the threat of poverty, through welfare such as universal basic income, seem to have positive knock-on effects on education, health, and the rest of the economy. And of course, helping children on these dimensions yields large dividends, often fully paying for itself. Anyways, Goldberg basically concludes that Hillary Clinton's fascism, I don't know what's with the conservative obsession with Hillary Clinton, but anyways, Hillary Clinton's fascism is not the police state of the Nazis or of Orwell's 1984, but rather it's a paternalistic fascism, Huxley's Brave New World, what Goldberg calls feminine fascism, nanny state fascism, not a boot stomping on a face forever, but rather a boot swaddling you like a little baby forever. 
And finally, chapter 10, The New Age, We're All Fascists Now. To start, Goldberg argues, If society is moving in a direction not of its choosing, it is often because it is being pushed by self-appointed forces of progress. Huh. Society being pushed in a certain direction against its will by self-appointed society controllers? Goldberg, are you JQ posting right now? Anyways, Goldberg follows this up with some tremendous media analysis. He talks about Forrest Gump and Fight Club and Dead Poet Society, American Beauty and The Matrix, among other films. All of his reviews are gold, but just to give you a little taste, here is just one of his little movie reviews. The Matrix, once regarded as a heroic tale of finding self-discovery through rebellion against the system, has later become understood as an allegory for being transgender. Er, no way, that's not what he said. He said... In The Matrix, a thoroughly fascistic allegory with some Marxist notes as well, Keanu Reeves plays a trapped bourgeois cubicle dweller. His handle as a computer hacker Neo not only represents his truer party name, as it were, but also encapsulates his status as a new man, an ubermensch who can bend the world to his will and eventually even fly. The parasitic, puppet-string-pulling agents of the system may look human, but are anything but. There seem to be a few of them, but they are everywhere, can take human form, and run everything. In short, they're the comic book versions of everything the Nazis said about the Jews? What? I don't think that's what that was supposed to be. They're always giving me anti-Semitic stuff to read. I'm pretty sure you could, like, watch The Matrix with a small child, and they would tell you that the agents, the machines, are the fascists in the story, imposing uniformity and control. Uh, But whatever. Goldberg does admit that many conservative films, like Dirty Harry, also have fascistic themes, but I don't really think this admission means much, since Goldberg follows this up by arguing that any film where the protagonist fights for a collective good outside of themselves is fascistic in nature. Silly stuff. Pushing back against the leftist idea that fascism is reactionary and therefore conservative, Goldberg insists, Conservatives aren't reactionaries. Few conservatives today would, or should, try to put the entire sexual revolution back in the bottle. Women's suffrage, birth control, civil rights, these are now part of the classically liberal order, and that's a good thing. Homosexuality is a fresher, and therefore tougher, issue for conservatives. Remember, this book came out in 2007 when conservatives were more openly homophobic. But, at least at the elite level, there are few conservatives who want to criminalize homosexuality. I love all the little qualifiers he has to put in there. Few conservatives today would or should try and put the entire sexual revolution back in the bottle. There are few conservatives who want to criminalize homosexuality. Not only this, he basically gives the game away by calling women's suffrage, birth control, and civil rights part of the classically liberal order aka something that conservatives support, when he knows very well that conservatives fought all those advances at the time, and they continue to attack him to this day. Conservatives are the first to challenge or bypass the democratic process. They want to roll back not just abortion rights, but many forms of birth control. And they were adamantly against the Black Lives Matter movement. This is a big failure of Goldberg's understanding. It's like he doesn't know what conservative or progressive even means. Progressives want to move forward, be better, and conservatives and reactionary movements want to keep things the same or return to what they see as an idyllic past. When Goldberg points to examples of liberals being racist or sexist or whatever in the past, a modern liberal can say, yeah, that's bad, I'm glad we progressed beyond that point. I hope to be even better in the future. In this way, America's past is conservative by definition, the liberals of the past being conservative compared to the liberals of today. Anyways, dear viewer, do you happen to be vegetarian or vegan? Well, Goldberg wants to remind you that Hitler believed that man had mistakenly acquired the habit of eating meat out of desperation during the Ice Age and that vegetarianism was the more authentic human practice. That's right. Hitler and the Nazis were obsessed with being vegetarian and organic food and being healthy and eating healthy, just like you, you vegan vegetarian fascist. And that's the argument that Goldberg chose to finish his book on. That liberals and fascists are the same because both think that organic foods and smoking bans are good. Literally the Hitler drink water and so do you, so you're like Hitler argument. 
Anyways, to really cap this all off, my version of this book has two afterwards. One of them called The Tempting of Conservatism, where Goldberg basically argues that the compassionate conservatism of the George Bush era is basically liberal fascism creeping into the conservative party. For example, when Bush said his favorite philosopher was Jesus Christ, old school conservatives should have seen this as a red flag, an obvious reference to the social gospel movement. I always thought conservatives loved jerking off Christianity, but go off King, I guess. And he chides Bush for raising Medicare and Medicaid, which are of course liberal fascist policies, I guess. The last afterword is titled Barack Obama and the Old Familiar Change. And it's about how Obama's calls for national unity are fascistic, stating, This idea, better described as a sentiment, that unity in and of itself has curative redemptive powers is quintessentially fascistic. That's right, the idea that unity is good is fascistic. Bring on the division, I always say. A house divided against itself stands super good with no problems at all, as Abraham Lincoln famously said. Finally, lamenting that his book came across a lot more doom and gloom than he had intended, Goldberg leaves us with one last clarifying statement. Here are the main points I would like readers to take away from this book. Original or classic fascism was not right-wing as we understand the term in the Anglo-American tradition. Contemporary conservatism has neither roots in nor affinity for classical fascism. Contemporary liberalism, in part thanks to its own dogmatic intellectual amnesia, retains an affinity for fascistic ideas through its profound indebtedness to progressivism. And the left's redefinition of fascism as merely anything undesirable has led America to look for fascism in the wrong places. An interesting story that, as we have seen, has no legs to stand on. Conclusion. Well, first let me say, to be honest, I think it's possible to write a book on this subject. If I were to write a book pointing out similarities between modern liberal-leaning folks and fascism, I could flex my pointer muscles and point to a few things. And I'm not just talking about wacky fringe stuff like eco-fascists or MAGA-communists. No, I could point to liberals ignoring systemic racism in studies and such, and instead focusing on random viral clips of individual interactions and making it all about white and black folks individually, which can often devolve into saying things like, white people are individually inherently racist. You're fucking a white male! Which is essentially Nazi-style race essentialism. Similarly, some liberals abandon systemic analysis of inequality and foreign policy, like logical critiques of various policies and institutions, and instead they talk about these individuals who make up the global elite, a secret cabal of billionaires controlling the world. Sounding like some Alex Jones QAnon brain conservative fear-mongering about Klaus Schwab or George Soros getting uncomfortably close to anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Or what about those hippie, naturalistic, spiritual, crystals and astrology alternative medicine liberals who went full anti-vax during the COVID pandemic? Are those folks not similar to Nazis in regards to dogmatic distrust of institutions in favor of the occult and pseudoscience? Speaking of thoughtlessly distrusting institutions, perhaps most importantly, I could point to all of those folks who just joined in on the crowds with whatever anti-establishment populist hero was hip at the time, whether it was Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, supporting a politician not because their policies are good, but because they're the anti-establishment hero, not unlike what Hitler's supporters thought of their Fuhrer. Long story short, there are flawed routes of argumentation that liberals can fall into which mirrored the flawed reasoning of fascism, and an interesting book could be written exploring that. But I guess Goldberg is just not familiar enough with the nuances of left-leaning arguments to parse these out, so instead we got this mess of a text. So, to conclude what I have to say about it, let me lay out my four main critiques of the book, Liberal Fascism. 1. Goldberg argues that two political groups agreeing on one part of an argument makes them the same. I don't think Goldberg intended to play a trick here, but there's a funny game being played which I've already mentioned, but to point at it again, point at it more vigorously this time, I think I might have some German shorthair pointer lineage in my family tree and I'm really flexing it right now, pointing at Goldberg and calling him out for looking at two ideologies who see a similar problem and have totally different solutions to that problem and arguing that these two ideologies are the same. If that's confusing, let's take a second look at an example I gave earlier in the video. A neo-Nazi might use identity politics to say that there is too much racial conflict in the U.S., and to solve that problem we must close the southern border and deport non-white citizens. And, using identity politics, a liberal would agree with the neo-Nazi that there is too much racial conflict in the U.S., but the liberal solution would be completely different. 
better representation of people of color in media, preferential loans and tax incentives to help diversify neighborhoods or universities or workplaces, or other changes that would help bridge divides between racial groups. These two things are not the same. Similarly, two, Goldberg looks at something all political parties do and then claims that since liberals and fascists both do those things, they are the same. As I said in the intro, many of the arguments of this book are equivalent to saying Hitler said he wants German citizens to succeed and Joe Biden says that he wants American citizens to succeed. They're the same thing, completely ignoring that all political parties make such generic appeals to their voters. What matters is what that means to them, how they attend to achieve that goal. Three, Goldberg moves the target between talking about liberals or leftists when it's convenient for him. He calls mainstream liberals fascists for pushing for government solutions to our nation's problems, such as food stamps or whatever. And then he calls leftists fascists for their militancy and extremism or whatever, and then turns around and calls mainstream liberals fascists again for cracking down on the activism of those leftist militants. Very incoherent reasoning, to say the least. And lastly, four. Goldberg completely ignores neo-Nazis, nationalists, Christian fundamentalists, the modern KKK, or any other fringe right-wing group whose extremism would kind of destroy this book's whole argument. This book goes so far out of its way to avoid the subject that out of 425 pages, here is every instance of the term neo-Nazi used in the entire book. There is only two uses of the term neo-Nazi in a 425-page book about modern-day fascism. Oh my god. By ignoring right-wing extremist groups like neo-Nazis, Goldberg doesn't see the pipelines that exist from mainstream Republican positions to far-right positions like Nixon's hard hats, the satanic panic of the Reagan years, the evangelical end-of-day folks of the Bush years, or the further movement of the Obama years, or the alt-right of the Trump years, or QAnon of the Biden years, or whatever. With those pipelines flowing further to the right, to neo-Nazi groups, KKK, fundamentalist Christian cult militias, and things like that. By omitting these pipelines, Goldberg missed a lot of the conservative fascism that should have made him rethink this entire book. Something he somewhat acknowledged at the end of his most recent book, Suicide of the West, where he remarks that the alt-right should have been kept down by the power of traditional conservative values and that the popularity of Trump's populist cult of personality caused Goldberg to rethink how susceptible conservatives are to totalitarianism. Goldberg thinks that Trump and the alt-right came out of nowhere when they were actually the very predictable outcomes of the trajectory of the conservative movement in the U.S. over the last few decades. Which, given Goldberg's understanding of fascism and conservatism, I can see why he is so confused. Just for fun, let's get in two final digs on this trash of a book. Here are some quotes from some reviews that I read. This first one is from History News Network, which states, This book is stuffed with references to scholarly work that make it look authoritative. But when something really surprising comes along, we look in vain for a footnote. Did Hitler really write a fan letter to that Jew-loving plutocrat FDR in 1935? No footnote. How do we know that the New Dealer Hugh Johnson read fascist tracts and for what purpose? And that FDR put 100,000 American citizens into camps? The list of bombshell remarks smuggled into the text without any reference to a credible source could go on and on. This next quote is from a review by his potential buddies at the Mises Institute, which states, Although liberal fascism contains much important information, its many mistakes require that it be used with extreme caution. Jonah Goldberg should acquire a more accurate knowledge of history before he presumes to instruct others. <laughs> Damn, that's fun. Anyways, as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. Your tremendous support has allowed me to get dog insurance, which is wonderful. You've allowed me to support other creators I couldn't otherwise support. Gotta love that. You helped me to spread my liberal fascist message and promote social justice and making the world better and all that horrible liberal fascist stuff. You gotta love that. You provide me with a little extra funds for books and dog toys, which is awesome. I appreciate you folks a lot. And if you like what I do here and you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash radical reviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the radical reviewer. Thanks for watching. Tell them that the Nazis never really went away. They're out there burning houses down and peddling racist lies. And we'll never rest again until every Nazi dies. All we want is to change America back to what it was. All we want is to change America back to what it was.
We won't ignore what our intelligence agency have determined to be the most lethal terrorist threat to the homeland today. White supremacy is terrorism. 